In this episode, we're going to have a quick look at Campfire, which is a new software created by 37signals, and it's one that's really interesting because you run it on your own servers. It's not a software as a service product, and it's one that you can host yourself, whether on your own hardware or in a cloud VM. And one really cool part about this, because it is built in Ruby on Rails, is that we get access to the source code as well. And so the first product being launched by Once is Campfire. And so I have a host instance of Campfire, and it's really cool because we can do a lot of different things in there. And really, it is just a very simple chat. So we can upload images, we can type in messages, and we can send them out, and we can get replies. You have the ability to do different kind of emotes, as well as invite others into your workspace. So it doesn't have all of the flexibility that you might find with Slack or Teams, but it does have a very simple chat, and for a lot of people, that's probably good enough. And if you think that $300 plus server costs is a bit too much for you, well then also consider that you are getting access to the source code as well, and there is a lot to learn from there. As a disclaimer, I wouldn't take everything within that source code as gospel because they did have certain kind of decisions that they had to make, but there are a lot of different kind of patterns that you can adopt from there that are really neat. And my intention is to create several different videos covering some of the different patterns found within Campfire. And so once we set up a virtual machine or some kind of server where we're going to host this, we don't need to do anything else except run the script that you get when you purchase the product. And as a disclaimer, I did pay the full price for the Once product, and they have not paid me or asked me to review this in any kind of way. But regardless, once you purchase the product, you're given a specific URL with a token. You'll paste this into your terminal while SSH'd into your server. And for me, I went ahead and exported the token as an environment variable just so it's not exposed in this video. I'll go ahead and run this. It'll install the once command. It'll ask us what domain we want to tie it to. And this is something where you can install it on one product or one server. You can't use this for multiple different use cases. I'll go ahead and confirm my application. And then it's going to prepare, which is then going to download Docker, install it. It'll download the Docker image for Campfire. And then it'll register a SSL certificate. And once that's all done, you should be good to go. If I do a Docker, container ls, you'll see that we have our one instance up and running. And notice that it didn't create any kind of database or anything else. It's all contained within this one Docker image. So the Docker container is going to run the Rails application, a SQLite database, and then also the Redis instance. And it's also using rescue for the background workers. So the name of this container is called Campfire. So if I were to do a Docker exec, and we'll put it in interactive mode. And we want to do this on the campfire Docker container. And I'll just put bash at the end to execute our shell. So this takes us into the running container. And if I were to do a ls lh, you'll now see that within this, we have access to the source code. However, if you're unfamiliar with Docker, or if you haven't messed around with it too much, it could be a bit tricky to get the application code out of the container and onto your computer. So I'm gonna exit out of the shell, and that takes us back to our server. And because we have that running container, which I can verify again with a Docker container LS, I can do a Docker copy from Campfire, and I wanna copy the Rails directory, and I wanna copy it to Rails. So what that's going to do is now I can go into, from my server, into the Rails directory, and now all of that application code is copied over, but this code still lives on the server. So if I did a sudo apt install magic dash wormhole, this is a neat product that will allow me to specify a directory and with that directory, it can send it over the wire. So with magic wormhole installed, I could do a wormhole send rails. That's then gonna zip up the project and it'll give me a link that I can then copy and then paste on another machine. So on the right hand side, I'm on my Mac, I'll do a brew install magic dash wormhole. And this is already installed. But if it wasn't, it would go through that process and install it. And we see that's already installed. Once you have it installed, I'm then just going to copy and paste that link that we got from the server, it'll ask us to verify that we want to copy it over. I'll hit yes. And then now it's copied over. 
I can now open up my editor and that project. And so now we have the full campfire source code on my computer. There's actually an easier way to download the source code, and we can do that with a curl o. We'll call it the campfire.zip. And then we can reference the link https auth.once.com forward slash download. And again, I have mine set as an environment variable for the token. And then it'll download the source code. And once that's done, you can extract the zip file. And then you have the source code right on your computer. The first thing when I'm looking at a foreign application is that I want to know a bit more about it. So the first thing that I always do is I go in and look at the gem file. I kind of want to see what I'm getting myself into here. And the first thing that I notice is that it's using Ruby 3.3.0. And I don't have Ruby 3.3.0 release candidate one on my computer. So I'm going to just change that to 3.3.0 so we can get this up and running. And it's also using the rails from the GitHub branch rails. So it is using the main branch on GitHub. Another interesting thing is that it's using SQLite. So it's not using Postgres, MySQL, or any other kind of database. It's using the standard SQLite that you'll get with a new Rails application if you didn't specify a different database. And I'm still a bit mixed on whether or not SQLite is really production ready. I think it just really depends on the use case. So before you go using SQLite for your production environment, you really need to see if it's the right fit. Everyone is going to have different needs. And maybe more often than not, SQLite will be the solution. But other times, you may need to get something a bit heavier like Postgres or MySQL. But as we scroll down, there's really not much going on in here. They didn't add too many gems, and this seems like this application may be easy to maintain as far as all of the gem dependencies. The next thing that I usually look at is the routes. I want to see how many different endpoints there are within this application and really just what some of the different routes are. We can see again that this is a very small application. There's not much going on, and there's really just a few endpoints to interact with. And that's kind of the point of the ONCE products, is that they're not trying to build ERP or enterprise level applications here. Otherwise, that would cost much more than a $300 price point. But instead, they're focusing on a simple chat system, and they want that experience to be simple as well. And so I'm not going to go into any more of the source code in this episode because I do want to save some of that for later. But let's go ahead and get this application up and running on our computer. So the first thing I did is run bundle to install any missing gems I may have had. One thing I noticed is that the bundle is locked to version 3.1.1, which is a bit strange because I looked on Ruby gems and I didn't see that version out there. So I'm going to just go ahead and do a bundle update string IO and you'll see that I actually downgraded it, but that's okay. But let's go ahead and just run bundle. Now everything is working. We can do the Rails DB migrate to migrate our database. Or you could do a Rails DB setup. And it ran through all the migrations. And then I'm going to type Rails S to start up the Rails application. So we can see now it's listening on port 3000. I'll open up my browser and now it's letting me in. I'll go ahead and fill out my credentials and I'll sign in. And it works. And there is one other thing to note is that there are some environment variables that needed to get loaded in. What you'll find is that you don't have a full experience on your local environment because it is missing some of those environment variables. So one of them is called the Vapid keys, which is used for the push notifications. And if we do a search for those, you'll see that it's trying to get the Vapid private key. If that doesn't exist and the public key doesn't exist, then it will refer to the Rails credentials. So if we want to get the Vapid private key and the public key, that is actually stored on the server. On the server, if we go to the .config, we'll look in there, you'll see a once, we go into once, and if we list out, there is a config JSON. And within there, I'm not going to show it because it does have my token, as well as some other private information. But within there, you'll find the Vapid public key and private key that you can then pull down and then use within your application. And with any kind of secrets, you want to handle those responsibly and protect them and not commit them into your source code. And so one thing to note about this is that it might be very tempting to modify this or to make your own changes to it, but I would recommend against that. It's a great way to learn the source code. And unless if you're okay with it not updating anymore because you're going to be adopting and assuming all the changes yourself, 
then diverging from the upstream branch could be a pretty dangerous thing to do. And I say all of this kind of hypocritically because I did actually get this up and running and deploying with Kamal, which I plan to do as a separate episode of how you could take a foreign application, dockerize it, and then use Kamal to deploy it. And one final thing to note about once is that if I just call the once command, which is now installed, you'll see that there's a lot of different options. If I call once upgrades, then that's going to give me a flag to turn on and off the upgrades. If I wanted to update this command line utility, I could do a once update and that'll update it. And I could do a once upgrade to upgrade my running application. It's going to download the latest version of Campfire. It'll stop the old container and start up the new one. And finally, if you're wondering where all your data is, whether it's the server or virtual machine where you have Campfire hosted, if you go to the root directory and then the directory var once campfire. And if we look at what's in there, you'll see that there's three different folders. We had the DB files and thruster. We can go into the files and I don't have any files uploaded, but if we go back to the DB folder and if we look in here, you'll see that there is our production SQLite database. And if we go into the thruster, you'll see that's where it's trying to set up the SSL certificate from Let's Encrypt. Well, that's all for this episode. Thanks for watching. For more videos, check out driftandruby.com.